afternoon to all of you. It's fantastic to see many of my friends around here. Hi, Fred. Few faces that I can recognize. My family, my 11-year-old daughter who's here. Jason, it's fabulous to see you guys. Look, I'm sure you've had enough of these statistics already. By 2050, one in four people on the planet will be African. Africa will almost be at par with Asia at about 2.5 billion people in 27 years' time. Put it into perspective, as a collective, we will easily be like what India and China is today. Consider the India, the Tata, that Fred just spoke about. Consider end financial services in China. Africa will be 25% of the world. The context of whether or not this matters has been heavily debated. Are more bigger population countries poorer or richer? Does it even really matter at all? But I can assure you something. When it comes to demography, size is everything. It's significant, especially in the context of median age. But maybe the question should actually be, why should Africa be at the forefront of innovation, given its very difficult and contradictory context? I want to take the opportunity to look at six cues to determine where and whether or not we should even bother around innovation in Africa. Let's go back to the demography. The problems that come with size are actually really, really good problems because there may come the answers we need for us to be able to create for problem solving. Africa is a green field playing field. Anyone who has done real economics and practiced it will tell you that it's easier to win in a lower competitive market than a monopolistic and or, or oligopolistic market. The problems of size mean that the law of survival actually applies. With size often comes necessity, which is the mother of all innovation. There is no argument to the fact that size is potential, particularly on our continent. Size equals addressable market. It's a customer base. No doubt, you are in a customer addressable base in 27 years that will be 25% of the world. Why wouldn't size matter? Size equals buying power. Even at the scalable nominal dollar a day economy in Africa, Africa's scale metrics are not that complex. You have to look at the mobile telephony operators, mobile money operators who have some of the largest businesses today that are disrupting financial capitalists, aka banks, to understand why a dollar a day matters on this continent. A dollar buys you airtime. A dollar buys you bread. It puts food on the table. So why wouldn't size matter for the scalability of GDPs? and the forming of new companies upon which scaled markets can be achieved if we create value in the real sense. Secondly, I just caught on the debate that was here. There is no doubt that Africa is a part of a global village. It is not in isolation from the world. The fact that Africa is part of a global village means that we have to leverage. We have to leverage that potential. Take a look at this, 1998, 25 years ago, there were no cell phones in Africa. 15 years ago, there were no laptops in Africa. Today, there are more SIM cards than toothbrushes. There are more devices than people. Internet access is getting better and more affordable. There will be up to 10 billion connected devices in 27 years on the African continent. Add to that, Africa's median age, which is 19, and half of that median age is half the population. It's good leverage. You might have had the old age. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. In Africa, we don't have old dogs. Africa has got a young population that can be re-educated and move and scale at speed. Africa must join the global market, but leverage. Make no mistake, it's local economies. Let's talk about maybe four of the top or five companies in Africa. MTN, Standard Bank, Sunlam, they operate 
across Pan-Africa. They're not operating internationally. I'm the chief group digital officer of the Sunlam Group. We're a $9 billion business company. We operate in 34 countries. We are 103 years old. <laughs> Sunlam Group started its insurance business through an agency workforce. When the Africaners realized that they were agro-producing and that they needed to create a, deriv a derivative instrument that would help them to guard risk their losses, is how this business started. I'm not going to talk about Standard Chartered Bank and what they're doing here 169 years later. I have no business talking about that. So why wouldn't Africa be best placed to innovate? Infrastructure gap is a blessing in disguise because we've got a blank canvas on which to draw from. Africa, actually no infrastructure may be a good thing for Africa. Think about USSD and how affordable it is for people to be able to transact. So we have leapfrogged infrastructure through mobile telephony, fiber infrastructure for connectivity, and green energy in various formats. Great. We also have a non-hierarchical non non wiki type, not archetype. The distribution prowess of spaza shops, agent networks, merchants, make a massive difference in Africa, getting to the market at low cost. We're talking about capital financing. If you're in Kenya, you know about the Chamers. In South Africa, we'll talk about the Sakwars. In Zimbabwe, we'll talk about the Mukandos. At the basic bear of Africa's culture is angel investment, whose scalable power we need to figure out and unlock. And I don't know whether Ken Jorege is here, my friend, founder of Cellulent, who has just started a venture capital fund for Africans by Africans, taking a scale up the chamas and the suckers is exactly what you need, we need to see more and more of. The land ownership advantage in Africa means that we can pivot for production and create an export market on which innovation can scale and thrive on. It's not everything we have to export. Some will be local economies, other things will export. Fourthly, the technological gains of no doubt enabled Africa to develop. And therefore, I think we can quantum leap as opposed to just leapfrog. Africa's digital intelligence today will be its artificial intelligence power. The data that Africa is harnessing is power in itself. AI has to solve for the education divide on this continent. The democratization of innovation has come in a very, very open season. Altman announced a few weeks ago before he got fired a developer day, that the company would make available tools to anyone across the world who could create their own version of ChatGBT. This is what's happening in the world is that we will, in the next 27 years, have super scalable access to tools and services that will allow Africa to solve for its problems. Finally, I will close on this today. 96 billion in remittances from African migrants, three times more than the sum of all foreign aid. It is important that we count the African diaspora when we count Africa's size. Venture is on the rise, 2021, 4.8 billion raised. That actually makes an average today of 1 million being raised in Africa every two hours. Every two hours. Africa is one of the fastest growing growth markets. But let me close by saying, make no mistake that the answer for Africa's continent is sitting in this very room and nowhere else. When we look at Africa, it's not enough for us to look at Africa in a 10-year span or a 20-year span. It is very important for us to look at Africa from a 200-year span. The fact that we have businesses in Africa that today exist over 180 years ago, is fundamental and important. In 27 years, I will be 67, and my 11-year-old daughter who's sitting in here today will be 38. That's important. I recently celebrated my father's 80th birthday. Joint 80-40, we celebrated 120 years collectively. This is the essence in which, when we consider Africa, we got to be looking at. I returned to the African continent in 2014 from London after Dr. Strive Masiwa asked me to come and give back. I was one of his founders for EcoCash. 
Africa's second largest mobile money operation. Building the business in seven years from zero to 12 million customers, 70% of Zimbabwe's GDP. When I was born in 1983, if you asked me whether I would have been at the coalface and the forefront of building one of Africa's most imperative technological divides, I would never have known. This continent has changed, and it has changed for good. And if you do not understand the power of demography and what it will do in a 200-year span, you are robbing Africa of its ability to scale and create. The creative power of the youth, the Generation P, we can see it all over in the Afrobeats in fashion. In 2022 alone, Afrobeats artists were streamed more than 13 billion times on Spotify. More than 8 billion the population of the world today. And if you are canvassing a dollar a day for the music, you can literally make African billionaires on this continent. I will close in saying that Africa's growth market still has to be serviced and it has a room and a role to play on, Afri on the world's global market. We have a lot at stake currently. Geopolitically, the uncertainty, we've just come out of a pandemic, but that creates a massive opportunity for Africa. Where problems are at, where there isn't a lot of geopolitical pressure, is an opportunity to build in stealth mode and is an opportunity for us to get organized and scale this Africa with a vision of a 200 year span. Thank you. Natalie Jabangwe, everyone. Thank you so much, Natalie, for bringing all of this to a fantastic close.